Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Ohio's uh, webinar on preservation stories. Our webinars are brought to you by the generosity of Heritage Ohio supporters. If you're not already a supporter, we, jo we would love to have you join us as we um, do what we can to help save the places that matter, build community, live better. Today, we're doing preservation stories. Each staff person invited somebody they've worked with in the preservation world. Uh, we have fascinating people that we work with every day, and we just wanted to share a little of that with all of you. So we're gonna start off, and I'm going to hand it over to Francis Jo Hamilton. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And Lindsay, thanks so much for agreeing to chat with us today. Um, I'm I'm always interested in sort of the the background information behind uh, successful entrepreneurs. So um, so I have a few questions for you, but I'd like for you to just kind of give us a very brief synopsis of uh, what your business is and what you do. Yeah, so I am the owner of Blind Eye Restoration. We're located in Columbus, Ohio. Um, my elevator pitch has developed over the years to, um, we are an architecture and art restoration firm, um, focusing on historic structures, maintaining the integrity of our historic buildings and really educating um, our clients as well as the public on the best practices for these historic structures and understanding how and why they're built differently and how we can maintain that uh, going forward. Great. Um, so my my first question for you is, uh, what's the backstory on how you got into Yeah, so I have just, you know, I feel like I've always been in construction. My father was, uh, he had a home repair company, a small one of his own, um, when I was growing up and I was the oldest kid. So at some point I was too old to go to daycare and I just went to work with him in the summers and he has this great engineering mind. And as much as I was like, I don't like this, I'm going to become an artist. Um, now I can't not look at things and just be like, oh, but I could do it better this way. And so <laughs> I've, I've kind of gotten pulled back into it because it's something that I just sort of innately feel like I get, I understand, I really like having my hands on things. Um, and when it actually came time to start my company, I had been working for a, a large scale developer who had done a couple of historic rehabs. I'd worked for an historic architecture firm that needed project management on their small conservation projects. Um, I'd had a background in historic preservation. I got a master's degree. I'm way overeducated to be a contractor, but um, it all kind of really blended into this perfect thing where I was like, you know, I'm never going to find that perfect job, that place that I want to work. So I'm going to make it for myself. And it just so happened that there's a market for that in Columbus. And it was affordable enough to be able to support myself. Got a couple of good jobs in the beginning. And um, I don't know, it just set me up for, for success being in the place that I was and knowing the people that I knew. Um, it all just kind of worked out. Um, not to say I didn't have any ability, but I, you start to feel a little unemployable because you're just like, ah, but I want to do this and I want to do that. And all of the dream things are not always in the same job. So I, I think I've kind of frustratingly created one for myself and um, the good would come with good that comes with that, uh, hopefully more than the bad. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so I, I've known a lot of entrepreneurs who decided I really love this certain thing. And so I'm going to make it my life's work and actually start doing a job doing this. And I've also seen a lot of them get bogged down and sort of lose their passion for, for that thing that they used to love so much. So how do you keep, um, keep that passion about the, the work when it becomes the day in, day out, and it has to pay your bills? <laughs> uh, it definitely is a thing. Thankfully, with restoration, no two days are the same. Um, and we have enough variety in our projects uh, that I feel like I'm always kind of learning something new. Um, definitely a jack of all trades, master of none, but I think the extension of that phrase is something like, um, but better 
to be a jack of all trades than a master of only one, something like that. And I, I think that having this ability to work on so many different things actually informs so many of our projects because you may think, oh, my job is only to work on this one item, but it happens to touch three other things in a home. And it's a really important to understand how systems and materials work together. And so thinking that you can only stay in one bubble is kind of, it's just not realistic anyway. And so if we let ourselves lean into that, you know, maybe we don't do this one thing all the time, but it kind of gets the creative juices going and it'll actually make us better contractors in the long run anyway to be flexible and thinking outside of the box more often. So I think that really helps a lot. Great, great. So what would you say is a priority or philosophy that drives the way you actually run your business? I I think education is a huge thing. It's something that I'm really driven by. It's something that we focus a lot on with my employees. We want to make sure that, you know, everybody understands exactly why they're doing the thing they're doing, not just put a, some, a, hand, a paintbrush in somebody's hand and just like send them off. Like you want to know all the little things that go into everything. It makes us a better company. Um, it makes our work better and I like sharing that information with our clients as well because in the long run it's better that they understand all the things that we're doing materials that we're using for repairs how the systems again work together um, so that they can be more informed about how to maintain their structures buildings what have you in the future if they were to talk to any other contractors if we were not available if it was something adjacent to work that we'd done so that they're not just getting drawn into some new shiny maintenance material, product, whatever. Um, they really understand that it's not um, specific branding that they're choosing. They're, they're choosing the proper practices and methods, um, really understanding everything about it. So yeah, I think education is, is one of the biggest things that we focus on um, and trying to make it fun. And um, when you're, well educated on everything um it just feels more comfortable everybody's less stressed you know how to talk about things when people ask you questions and um, it makes the whole process a lot more enjoyable great um so what is, what is one thing that we may be surprised to know about this kind of the kind of work that you do I don't know if it's super surprising. Um, I am not, I mean, I, I'm not any kind of ambassador for anything, um, but I, I get a lot of people who ask me about like, what are my favorite products or, you know, what paint brands do I use or um, favorite tool brands. I'm definitely not a brand person at all. I get, um, I don't want to say lazy, but it's something that I don't care about as much. And I think because we're so, focused on making sure that we just have the right product um, or that things are working together as they're supposed to on a material level that we need to know more about what we're using than a simple brand. Um, so I honestly think that there are a lot of things that we might hear of as bad. So like when you're glazing windows, um, DAP33 gets a lot of grief. Um, and it may not be the best product for the job, but it does the job in a pinch. Um, I wouldn't use it on our projects, but if somebody came to me and said, is this gonna screw everything up? I'd say, absolutely not. It does what it says it's supposed to do. Maybe it doesn't last a hundred years the way that some other projects would, but I'm not gonna tell you that it's not a good product. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of things when you're working on historic buildings, the thing that was used originally is not always super accessible or available. And so we get pretty creative in the things that we use and you sometimes probably be surprised by our tactics um, in that we don't necessarily always travel with the, the new construction crowd and best practices that they follow, but we get creative um, with the materials and methods that we use based on just understanding where the end goal is. 
that is it's a usual unusual i would say when it comes to contractors because i have a lot i feel like a lot of contractors do get really endeared to a certain uh brand of product so uh good mm -hmm. to know that, that blind eye can be a little creative when it comes to uh that process um, mm -hmm. I just have one additional question for you, and I I always love to ask a question having nothing to do with work, which is, uh, what is it that you like to do when you're not doing uh, your restoration projects? <laughs> um, I actually live in a restoration project, so it's <laughs> it's kind of hard to get away from it. Um, I'm in the middle of a bathroom remodel that technically I would love to get back to if I ever have the time for it. Um, <laughs> we, I think more than anything, we do a lot of gardening. Um, my partner is uh, an arborist, so he's obsessed with trees and making our backyard into like this kind of uh, oasis that you wouldn't expect in the city. And we have vegetable gardens and fruit trees and I definitely spend as many mornings as I can first thing, just like walking out of the house with my cup of coffee and expecting, inspecting all of the things and new leaves that have <laughs> popped out in the spring. It's probably my favorite time of year. I I totally hear that. You've you've been to the farmhouse, so we we have something in common, <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would like to uh, give you a moment to kind of promote the hands-on restoration uh, programming that we're doing in Wellington on September the 22nd. If you'd like to say a couple of words about that, and then if anyone has any questions for Lindsay that you'd like to type into the chat box. Uh, please do so and um, we'll take questions next. Yeah, so the Wellington Trades Fair is going to be fantastic. It's just one day. We are going to have a bunch of booths set up with contractors who are out here to talk about their specific trades and how the preservation trade related to their field, uh, how it works differently, how the materials are kind of different, how their tools are a little different than modern construction. So we're going to have masonry, carpentry, um, some metal restoration, wood windows, uh, plaster, and um, roofing, or, uh, shake, not shake, um, slate, and slate and tile, box gutter kind of persons. Um, everybody will be out there with tools of the trade, be able to answer questions throughout the day and we'll actually have everybody up for a 30 45 minute talk throughout the day to just give a, a synopsis so if anybody just wants to come out and listen to the talks you're more than welcome we also have um you can just come and quickly go around the booths and talk to whoever's available ask them about projects specific to your home um, we will have uh, a local architect there who will be giving a little bit of a lowdown on the history of Wellington's architecture and styles. We will have financial advisors there to talk about different types of loans, uh, tax credits, things of that nature, if you're interested in seeing what you can get for your project. Um, and just generally, it'll be, I think, a lot of fun. Um, we've got the local hardware store connected so that they are aware of you know the different materials tools projects that we've got going on in case anybody wants to go and talk to them about hey i just talked to the masonry guy do you carry these tools that type of stuff so everybody's in the know and it's just going to be a fun day um very informative uh we'll have a list of somewhat local contractors to the area but the people who are there even though they are contractors are really there to teach and give everybody the information they need to just have a good understanding to at least conversationally talk about their projects um, and really understand what they need to move forward successfully. Well, I know I'm really looking forward to our Wellington training. This will be our first in-person training uh, post the beginning of the pandemic. So really excited that we can be outdoors and uh, um, so every, everything will follow you know, protocol for uh, COVID friendly safety. Um, and I, I really appreciate Lindsay, you putting together the the hands-on capabilities that we're gonna have in um, 
in Wellington. And Joyce, uh, put a little note in the chat box, you can visit the Heritage Ohio website to register for the training. It's on September the 22nd, so make sure you all do that today. And aside from that, I'm not seeing any questions, Lindsay, but if they come in later, then I might ping you. Um, but thanks so much for chatting with me. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It was great having or great, great being here. <laughs> Joyce, I'm going to hand it back over to you to introduce our next interviewee. Okay. Well, actually, we're going to go back to Devin, who will introduce Eric. Take it away, Devin. I need presenter mode, too. So uh, as we get started with uh, Eric's presentation, uh, I'm pleased to introduce all of you to Eric Van Rentergem. Uh, he's uh, owner of the Jones Mansion in Findlay, Ohio, my hometown. Uh, I grew up about two and a half blocks away from the Jones Mansion as a child. My grandmother always would go to the Fifth Third Bank that's diagonal from the mansion. So I had a 20 plus year uh, view of the mansion up until the point Eric started working on it. Uh, so it's been a pretty wild adventure. Uh, so uh, just to let you know, Eric uh, is not only, you know, resides in Hancock County, just outside of Findlay. He's also a former school teacher, uh, recently retired, also a long, long time preservationist in Findlay, Ohio, and uh, working uh, and advocating around the state for historic preservation. So, Eric, uh, why don't we uh, get started uh, on going through the Jones Mansion's, you know, brief history, and then we'll start showing people some renovation photos. Thanks, Devin, uh, for the invite. Well, the, I see the picture is up. It certainly didn't look like that when we first got the house. Uh, I'm, I'll be, I'll be 65 in a month. And I'm just curious of the ages. It sounds like Lindsay's maybe in her 30s. So I'm just excited to have young people jump in. As a former history teacher, I was always uh, cajoling my students. And we did tours in the house. We did walking tours when I taught at Central Middle School. Uh, but the house um, kind of fell upon me. Was that the question, Devin, about the house itself, how I got the house? Uh, well, yeah, you can talk, you know, just a little bit briefly about, you know, it's kind of transition through life from Elijah owning it to its days as a boarding in and then up to the point you got it. Okay, so Elijah P. Jones, Willoughby, Ohio, came here at 29 years of age, um, was the first leasee of the first railroad in Finley and uh, bought three lots here in 1849, 50 and 51 and moved a house to the rear, a Greek revival and a cabin a log house he took a part eventually but eventually built the house here and we're thinking it's about maybe 1866 to 67 to get started we're still doing research on it and so we built this uh, magnificent home over a period of probably a couple of years it's 9,000 square feet three full stories a full basement with a summer kitchen down below in the basement uh he married, uh, uh, his first wife passed away giving birth, came to Finley as a widower and ended up marrying um, Pamelia Johnston from the Johnston farm. If you're familiar that with Piqua, Ohio, that was her uncle, the one that worked with the Native Americans up there to sign the treaty. So it's really kind of a fascinating uh, story of the house and its transition. So Mr. Jones died in 1894 his wife lived in 1914, but the last year of her life, she moved to her son's mansion, which is on South Main Street. And upon her passing in 1914, the house uh, sadly was vacant for seven years until 1921, when uh, Caroline Roberts, the woman whose house, uh, who estate I bought the house from, her mother bought the house in 1921 for $10,000 with the idea of starting the Lynn Mauer Inn, which she did. It was a place, a boarding house. Uh, she offered uh, food and lodging and did sewing. She did wedding dresses. She made candy. The woman was uh, ahead of her time, but just a very um, independent woman who eventually married after two years and her and her husband, Joseph, ran it. Um, Caroline passed away. Uh, well, it'll be, it was, it'll be 10 years here in October 9th, and we acquired the house from her state. So uh, Caroline's mother and Caroline herself owned the house longer than the, actually the Jones family, and we're starting our 10th year, Devin. 
Yep. Uh, and so, uh, really, uh, Eric, you know, this is like, you know, kind of a, you know, a kind of quirky, fun story about how you just became friends with Caroline. And then, you know, at, when, when she died, you know, you had the opportunity to uh, acquire the property through the estate. And, you know, you know, really, what were your, uh, you know, impressions when, when you got, you know, the opportunity to do this, you know, particularly the state of the home? And really, you know, what drew you into, you know, wanting to undertake this project? Well, people have quoted me in Finley, there's never, a, there's never an old house that Eric meets that doesn't like. So I always think something's <laughs> salvageable, and it really is to a, to a degree. I'm teaching history, loving history, dealing in it as an antique dealer for 40 years. Um, my dad had Napoli Pizza across the street in 1956 and the 19- 60, 61, he used to drag me over there and I'd sweep out front and could look at the house across the street, which looked like you know, the house from the Adams family or the Munsters on TV. And I always thought it was a, such a cool house. And my uh, oldest son, who'll be 40, when he was younger, we'd drive past it. And I told him one day, we're gonna own that house and laughed. So we'll turn it into a restaurant. And he said, that's great, dad. We're just gonna serve spaghetti and green beans, which was his f- favorite food at that time. So lo and behold, all those years later, I met uh, Caroline through the museum, um, called me and said, this woman wants to put her house on the National Register. And I knew the house, I jumped at it. And the late, great Sandra Davies, um, who was the State Historic Preservation Officer um, at that time. No, actually she was uh, Bowling Green doing finishing her master's degree. Um, her and I tackled a, a register and got it on the National Register um, in 1984. And from then, Carol and I became sort of friends, and I'm not gonna go into the details. She was a, a hard-nosed woman. I loved her to pieces, but she let, you, she let you know how she felt, and sometimes her language would embarrass a drunken sailor. That's all I'm gonna say. So along the way, we became friends. She'd call for a leaky faucet or her window was broken. And as she got uh, elderly, she had no children. She was been widowed for 20 years. She uh, asked me if I had any interest in the house and she wanted me to be her uh, probator will and she asked me if, if if I wanted the house and I said yes and but then she said well I just got a reverse mortgage and I thought well I'm not going to get the house given to me people said with well, Eric you got the house given to you whether well, it's an $80,000 reverse mortgage so she died about 8 months after we had the conversation in Wells Fargo started uh, foreclosures. We had to scramble to get the 80 grand to pay the house off. And from there, it's been um, a, a journey. And you can, my wife will give you a different side of the story, but she's, <laughs> she's, been, she's been with me. I'm the, I'm the uh, protagonist, I'm the, the preservationist, but she, she uh, there's moments she really loves the house. And uh, so I said, I just want to restore it and give it some value because Caroline, who had the house before was worried about Marathon, which is, I can see the building from my window now. She was worried about Marathon buying more property and acquiring property to tear down for um, parking lots. Uh, definitely always a concern around that area. Oh well, yeah. You know, I'm sure many people in the audience are kind of wondering, you know, how does a teacher really afford to start undertaking a project like this? So can you briefly uh, kind of discuss uh, your how you kind of begin to assemble financing for the phases of this work in progress? It's kind of like dog paddling. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, Lindsay uh, you know, alluded to, you you dive in head first and, and you worry about the financing later. The, the thing that really uh, saved us was the state historic tax credits and the federal tax credits. And that's what we, we relied on to help fund this project. Because what Devin had alluded to, I had several people saying, aren't you just a teacher? And did you know what you're getting into? Just a lot of uh, kind of derogatory remarks, which has got me even more angry and showed them I was gonna get it done, that we were gonna get it done. So I relied on my network of friends in the banking and Nathaniel Kalin was uh, the first director there at the, for the uh, Ohio Department of Development. and they were giving out these huge, um, we were in the 10th round, but they were giving, you know, awarding monies to people who were doing three and four and $5 million projects. And I said, you need to do a small project. I mean, you need to show you can do that. So um, we went in for a half million dollars and uh, he agreed and he called me one afternoon. I was at Dietz's with my family and grandkids and said, Eric, you've been awarded 
<clears throat> that money, I get a little uh, emotional now because that money, I'm telling you, and with the federal money, I could could have never have attempted this on my teacher salary. My wife's a teacher as well. So um, through that and um, like Lindsay knows, sweat equity, I, I plumb, I wire. Um, I even did masonry work. It is hard to find anybody uh, worth their spit that can contract in those old houses. So you end up learning things yourself and, you know, like YouTube and gosh, when Old House Journal was, was just a magazine that Clem Labine and the woman's name eludes me back in the late 70s and early 80s, I still got stacks of those, Devin. So it's just the whole idea of uh, preser preservation and pursuing and not letting people cloud your dreams and just go after it and you, you'd be surprised at the people and friends that you meet um a friend of mine's brother retired from colorado he was a building superintendent contractor he's 67 so he's 67 i'll be 65 and a classmate of mine he'll be 65 the three of us were like the three old men and three hammers um okay. been tackling this project for for most of it so it's um it's uh it's it's networking and we've actually um kind of become a little family that was great oh, eric Eric, so, that's uh, right <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, for sake of time we're going to kind of combine uh two things into one here so i thought it would be interesting to go instead of just showing everyone a bunch of after photos really i like you know because now the jones mansion's an event center for those of you that don't know uh, that's what eric ultimately decided upon the functionality for the building and to you know raise funds for more renovations in the building so i thought it'd be interesting to kind of show people the afters of the finished sections uh through events so eric uh you know you've done a lot of events over the years now uh and you know really interesting things like you know your father with napoli's pizza you know not only you know is that important to you and it's a fundraiser to the mansion but also you know it's like resurrecting findley history that you know a younger generation is completely unaware of you know you've really done some just amazing events at the mansion so really what goes into your kind of thinking process on what events to do at the mansion <laughs> Good question. I my wife says uh, I have I'm ADD or ADHD, which I probably am. <laughs> I get restless at night and I get up and write stuff down. You always got to be thinking of ways when you buy it, when you get a project or this project falls in your lap. Obviously, like Devin mentioned, you have to find a way to, to fund it. And so we kind of just went forward with uh, Caroline's mom, and we we do dinners and luncheons and teas. He saw a picture Elliot Lewis who plays with. Paul and Oates and played with Cheap Trick. I've got to become friends with him. We can get 60 people seated in here in two rooms. He's been here uh, three times or four times, and he's very reasonable in his rates with me because he loves old houses. Um, we do a fantastic, we've done Titanic dinners because there is a connection with the Jones family, new Captain Smith of the Titanic. And so we do Titanic dinners here. Uh, Devin, we've done 168 programs over the decades maybe even more um, oh, from, from local <laughs> history tours and dinners and all that kind of stuff devin uh we have a liquor license which has helped us out a lot that's where the money is and we have a the bistro on maine is our 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 caterer so things work uh hand in hand we have usually three uh, open houses walking tours october is our haunted history month we actually resurrect stories of actual stories and we actually it's kind of like we have a theater going on in each floor and people can explore and listen to some of the horrific things that happened in the 1870s so uh just whatever we can do to to bring people devin i mean it's yeah you know, it's so impressive eric you know <laughs> just you know, have 168 events you know over the course of you know less than a decade of time you know it's just impressive so one final question for you eric what advice would you give to you know another public school teacher out there that's you know got a similar building in their hometown that they you know really would like to you know see turn into something you know whether it's going back into a residence whether it's you know 
becoming an event center or something else really you know really what would you do to say you know this is possible for them well you know any anything's possible i guess do your homework um make sure you have a good network make sure you you, you have friends in the financial industry and in the markets um and uh, Ohio History Connection, Mary Angela Feaster. I mean, I've been with the, with those people for working for 40 years. Um, so all that networking, Devin, working with you guys um, uh, uh, in the past. So uh, you just you gotta never it's never say never. It's like the Goonies, right? Never say never. Don't quit. Um, uh, go forth. You might have to take a breather every now and then. You may have to look around the floor to find some quarters, nickels, and dimes. To pay for things but Devin we've had people come out of the woodwork donate five hundred dollars here or a thousand dollars because they're just so uh, pleased with what we're doing and these are people in the neighborhood that don't or are not bankers or marathon people these are common day people so don't discount that and like uh, uh, Mrs. J Ms. Jones said um, educate 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 get get the word out there get connected with your chamber and different places like that and uh, make preservation and history fun like it should be even though it's a lot of sweat but sweat equity is where it's at thank you eric joyce i'll turn it back to you evan thanks so much eric okay we are going to uh hand the presentation over to we met jessica lucas last spring when she wrote to us uh, to us for some help regarding the Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church in Burlington, Ohio, which is down in Lawrence County. It sits along the Ohio River about 20 minutes southeast of Ironton, which is the county seat. And I believe Jessica by profession is a yoga instructor, but now she's a preservationist instead. So Jessica, <laughs> why don't you tell us a little bit about the historic importance of the Macedonia Miss Missionary Baptist Church? Thank you so much, Joyce, and I really appreciate the invitation to be here today. Um, that's correct. I am a yoga instructor and I'm an after school um, teacher as well. So I've been working in after school programs for several years. Um, but the most important thing that I'm here to talk about today is Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church. And it is significant as the first uh, black church that was organized west of the Alleghenies, organizing in the 1790s. Uh, making it the first black church in the state of Ohio um, and the only antebellum black church still standing in Ohio uh, based on um, other people's research, not just my own. Um, so it's a remarkable site. Uh, beyond those three things I've just listed about how important it is as um, a black church in our region, um, it also, the congregation was home to uh, manumitted slaves. So it became a safe haven for manumitted slaves, uh, became a, a, a black settlement, a free black settlement right on Macedonia Hill. The church of course was the cornerstone of that beautiful and thriving settlement. Um, and those folks, uh, the church members, uh, the preachers, the churchgoers were working the front lines of the Underground Railroad. So they were providing safety, sanctuary, aid, um, and sometimes literal guidance through the woods um, on the Underground Railroad trails. Uh, right on the banks, near the banks of the Ohio River, uh, it was sometimes the first stop on the Underground Railroad for freedom seekers crossing what was known as the River Jordan to the Promised Land. So this is a site of great history, uh, a, a site of sanctuary, safety, and, and freedom for so many. Uh, Jessica, this is really an amazing story about how did you get involved in this project? So that's that's an interesting uh, question, and, and and with being short on time, I'll, I'll give you the the nutshell version of it. Um, of course, a pandemic happened, uh, and one of the things that I excel at is research. And some of the folks in our region, Southern Ohio, were talking about the importance of highlighting and recognizing underground railroad sites in our region. So as someone who grew up in Lawrence County, Ohio, I was familiar with Macedonia Church and knew that I had been told um, by some of the elders, some of the actual descendants of Macedonia settlement, 
that this site was a, an important stop on the Underground Railroad. The, the, the thing that was missing for me, and I'm speaking from personal experience, uh, that I was not taught that in history classes growing up. I was not um, privy to the information. And so uh, during a pandemic, uh, having a little bit more free time, I wanted to use my skills in a way that could help, you know, uh, lift and amplify the truth of the Underground Railroad sites in Lawrence County. I started, um, researching Macedonia and then got in touch with some folks at the National Park Service and Deonda Johnson at the Park Service suggested that a Network to Freedom nomination should be written for Macedonia Church. So I took my love of research, my love of learning, my curiosity, along with the uh, enthusiasm and passion for amplifying and elevating the true history, the full picture history of Lawrence County, kind of combined those and started meeting some amazing people, including some of the board of directors of Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, um, descendants, and yeah, I, I, I could go on and on, but that's a short version of how I got involved. So to follow up on that, tell me how hard is it to insert yourself as kind of an outsider, perhaps culturally, as well as just not being a member of the church, the member of those descendants? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. So I, I don't necessarily feel, um, I, I feel like the most, the greatest difficulty inserting myself is understanding preservation work <laughs> and, and not so much um i didn't feel so much like i was inserting myself into anything if that makes sense i made it very clear from the beginning with all the networking and connections that i made um what my intentions were and and that i was here to only share the history elevate the history amplify the history and then of course do what i could um, as a lay person to work towards not only sharing that history, but hopefully saving this uh, historic site, this historic structure. So I guess my short answer is I don't think the greatest difficulty was working with. I, I feel like I worked with, I want to show up and be there to offer enthusiasm and support when it's helpful. You know, uh, the greatest difficulty I think was inserting myself uh, in the preservation world. And, and bless your heart, Joyce, with the patience and, and guidance of so many that do this for a living, I've learned so much. Um, but I think that was my greatest difficulty or has been so far. Oh, that's a great learning lesson for us. <laughs> we don't, we, you know, <laughs> that it's hard for people to break into the preservation world. Sorry oh. about that. Uh -huh. um, uh, Jessica, tell me what some of the challenges are, particularly of this project being in a tri-state area. So um, being in a tri-state area, those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with Southern Ohio uh, geography and what that looks like even economically, we are, um, uh, we are Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia all there together. Now, the beautiful thing um, in regards to the history, beautiful meaning that we can easily um, research it and, and then share it with others, is that a lot of the folks that migrated to Macedonia may have been um, traveling from Kentucky, escaping from or traveling from, depending on whether they were manumitted or, um, or, or fleeing, uh, actively fleeing slavery, came from what was then Vir Virginia and is now West Virginia. So from that aspect, it's in a beautiful uh, spot to help uh, work as a centerpiece or a cornerstone of of a bigger picture story, right? Um, but when you think about how the difficulties arise is that you might have folks in Kentucky that want to help, but then they're like, oh, that money's gonna need to come from Ohio, or that's a, a state issue, or, or we'll have to wait till it gets to a national level before we can get involved. Um, so the challenge then is trying to figure out how to weave a bigger picture of, of a network. And I heard Eric uh, pointing out the importance of networking, and, and it really is, but that's where some of the difficulty lies, is that you might have interest, for instance, at Marshall University that's in West Virginia to share and amplify the black history of this site, 
to, to utilize it um, to educate others about the region's Black history and, and just all of the information that can be shared there. But since they're in West Virginia, it kind of sometimes complicates things because you need the work of Ohio senators and representatives and bankers and uh, all of the all of the elements that need to come together beyond just interest that lies in Kentucky and West Virginia. I hope that makes sense, but that's kind of where things become a little more complicated is finessing the balance um, of, of all the folks who might be interested who exist <laughs> in other areas. I'm glad you also see the benefits of it, you know, that it isn't just challenges that are benefits too. Jessica, share with us what your top three goals are for this building. So the top three goals um, that I think are shared, I don't want to speak as if I'm in charge of this. Um, as you pointed out, I'm a volunteer. I'm an, you know, passionate uh, researcher and, and advocate for preservation. Um, but this, you know, needs to come down to the, the descendants, the wishes of the ancestors, and, and what would they want to see happen and what do they want to see happen. So I always want to make sure to shift that focus away from myself and to the folks that uh, truly matter here, and, and that's the, the ancestors and descendants. And I believe that a shared um, goal, the three shared goals, are number one, emergency stabilization of the structure. Um, as you see here, this photograph, I think, was taken just after the site was listed on the National Register for Historic Places, so probably in 1979, 1980. Um, over time, you know, with weather elements, the, the building is starting to deteriorate um, and is facing some, some challenges to the structure itself. So number one goal, keep the structure standing, right? Emergency, emergency stabilization. Um, the second goal is more of a long-term goal, and that's a historic structure report. Um, with, the with the help and the work of the folks you see here, um, among others who are not photographed, you'll see Mr. Calvin Benson here, an architect, Mr. Charles Bertram Alexander, Mr. Lacey Ward, um, Army Corps of Engineers, and Mr. Chuck Lithicombe, who is um, a, a descendant of Macedonia. And so they want to work towards a historic structure report to help guide the restoration um, efforts. And then that leads to the third and uh, maybe not ultimate goal, but uh, ultimate in the sense of the three goals that I'm listing now, and that is to have a restored, refurbished, protected, and preserved site that can be utilized perhaps to share then the history not only of Macedonia, but of um, the Black Settlement, the Underground Railroad Trails, and the uh, Black history of, of Southern Ohio and the Tri-State region. Fabulous. So my final question is, considering all of this context and everything you've learned, what advice do you have for other preservation volunteers? Uh, I think the first one is don't allow fear to stop you from exploring how you can be involved. Um, Eric did a great job of pointing out some of the points that I was already going to make, and so I am appreciative and inspired uh, by him. And that is, don't don't stop, don't quit because you're told that it can't be done. I think a big um, barrier, uh, I don't see it as a barrier anymore, but a lot of people will see it as a barrier is that folks will say, oh, it'll never, we'll never be able to raise the money in time before it falls to the ground. Or, you know, uh, there's not enough interest in wanting to elevate the black history of Southern Ohio and to share this history of this church. Um, I've even have had folks tell me, well, you know, that's, um, and not something you should be involved in. And, and I understand uh, the concern and fear that maybe it can't be done, but if we, if we don't start somewhere uh, and work together collaboratively um, and, and seek out possible uh, options towards preservation, then, then, the, then the first uh, concern might be the case, and that is that it will fall to the ground. So why not try to work with uh, collaboratively, um, others to find solutions, brainstorm solutions, explore potential options. Um, so I would, that's my advice. Don't allow fear. And it's, again, very similar to what Eric said. 
don't allow people to diminish the dream before you've started to see it uh, come to fruition. I believe that if you dream it, it is possible. This is not my dream. Again, I want to be clear. This is a dream that has been um, spoken about and shared for, for years. Folks have been wanting to do something to save and preserve this site. Uh, but as a volunteer, I would say to other volunteers, roll up your sleeves. What can you offer in this movement? Uh, maybe that's research like myself. Maybe it's networking maybe it's your passion and your enthusiasm maybe you don't know about preservation but you can learn you know and don't be intimidated by the words you don't understand or the uh elements of preservation work that you don't quite get because there are folks along the way that will help you learn that's great jessica does anybody have any questions quick uh type them into the chat box and uh I don't Do you know have if you'll be able to hear the sound, but I want you to hear the church bells ringing. Those are the outhouse. Okay. Can you hear that? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> I think not as robust as <laughs> the intention. Okay, well, that is um, the church bell was transported on the Ohio River to the Macedonia Black Settlement in the 1880s, maybe the late 1870s, um, added to the original structure along with the bell tower, probably around 1880s, maybe late 1880s. Um, and I just wanted to close with that, but I would love to answer any questions if anybody has or suggestions, you know, do you have any thoughts, ideas, or questions? Uh, there's always a little lag if people are typing, can type quick and we can always come back to it. <laughs> our, our next story, um, Frank Quinn will be introducing Matt Wiederhold and I am going to uh, give Frank uh, Matt the presentation There you go. And I'm going to take over real quick by saying, hey, everyone. And in Medina, it's nestled away in northeastern Ohio. <laughs> hey, that's not funny. <laughs> I don't know that we're quite nestled away. <laughs> well, we're so not I've your main a feedback You're problem right. here, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, yeah, you are nestled away, whether you know it or not. There's this uh, quaint little uptown uh, area in Medina. If you love historic preservation, if you love historic downtowns, and you haven't been to uh, Medina yet, you need to go and make a day of it. The, the thing with the preservation and revitalization world is that the person most intimately connected to Main Street Medina is Matt Wiederhold who has been their longtime downtown director. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Matt for, uh, yeah, I don't know, almost 20 years now. And much yeah. like Lindsay, our first uh, speaker, when Matt goes home, he does not take off his historic preservation hat. He puts on his personal uh, preservation hat and he, um gets to work on his latest rehab project so right now i'm gonna let matt share with you some of his more um maybe interesting projects that he's engaged in over the years so take it away matt thank you first do we, how do we do this so that i can show a presentation okay i think matt just a second um less choice well, I gave him a panelist opportunity. Oh, it says show my screen. All right, what are you guys seeing? Okay, I see I see a man who's shouting uh, because he's just accomplished something wonderful, maybe. Um, possibly, or trying to figure out why the hell are there six boards making up this header over a doorway. <laughs> so as frank said he and i have known each other for a very long time our paths have crossed we're both michigan boys and we share a love of architecture uh, but frank reached out and said hey would you, would you be willing to share some of your stories about your house projects and i said sure so i'm kind of a serial renovator um so 
I'm on project number nine and thought I would just run through some of them and give you some thoughts, some insights on, on residential preservation, some of the experiences that I've had, and then trying to calculate the number, the quantities of things that I've done, which will be the last slide, it'd be pretty funny for you. So, oh, but is it gonna actually go? There we go. I grew up in the country in the flat Midwest fields of Southern Michigan. We were surrounded by farms, both active and not. Very often on Saturday afternoons, my dad and I would get in his truck and go explore abandoned farmhouses around the county. I was fascinated by the history and the stories, but most importantly, I didn't understand how someone could just walk away from a house and let it die. My father was a tool and die maker at an automotive plant. I was not gifted in mechanics, nor was I interested in sports or scouting. Early on, my dad taught me woodworking, how to build and how to fix things. We started out making simple birdhouses, and from there, each project grew more complex and involved. I think that was his way of trying to find a connection with me as a son. It is from this simple act that a lifelong addiction grew. I became obsessed with exploring and restoring things that others threw away. I love to explore the history of a property and see if I can recapture what it once looked like or honor its past. I love to play with design and sometimes treat my homes more like theater sets than living spaces. I love to uncover the transformations that a home has gone through and understand the people who lived there and why they did what they did. I guess you could say that I'm an unlicensed Indiana Jones exploring residential archaeology. Over the past 25 years, I've owned nine homes and renovated 10. For the most part, my homes have, my moves have been due to life changes in my career or relationships. I hope you enjoy this hopefully quick walk through my old house journey. I graduated college in 1992 with a degree in art history focused on American art and architecture. I bought my first house in 1994 and completed the renovation started by the previous owner. I loved this little house. It was cozy and historic, a 1200 square foot cottage in the old west end of Toledo. Most of the work on this house was cosmetic and playing around with capturing the 1880s aesthetic. When I bought the house, it featured a huge cast iron tub and the shower was in the basement. One day I ran home from work to grab a quick shower before an evening rehearsal and it had rained very heavily that day. I started down the basement stairs only to be met by murky water with floating things halfway up the stairs. I felt like I was in the trash compactor scene in Star Wars. I later realized that the storm sewers had backed up and my basement and shower and hot water tank and furnace were all literally covered in dookie. I went back upstairs, got out the latest edition of Victorian Homes and ordered a reproduction shower surround for the clawfoot tub. That was my first and forced foray into plumbing and bathroom renovations. Irving Street was a fun, cute place to practice different interior finishes and aesthetics. I probably changed the living room three or four times in five years, and I'm also obsessed with period light fixtures and wall treatments. When we decided to move from the small house into something larger, we settled on a huge historic and darn near condemned 4,500 square foot shingle style home designed by noted Toledo architect, Edward O. Fallis. It was literally around the corner from the house on Irving Street. We had a family picnic and then walked everyone around the corner to show them a new place. My mom cried, my dad laughed. You could see through the roof from the first floor. There was no working plumbing or heating. The roof was like Swiss cheese and the porch was like a bouncy house. We paid $30,000 for it. And over the next four years, put in about $120,000 in renovation and thousands of hours of sweat equity. We called it the green monster because it was green and scary and because it took nearly every dollar we had to finish it. My dad had recently retired and became our right hand man working side by side, rewiring all four floors, three breaker boxes, 400 amps of power, routing wire and discussing the porch reconstruction. It was during that that my father became my friend and I also became obsessed with shingle architecture. One day I stopped home for a lunch break and my dad told me that a car jumped the curb and went through the front porch. I almost believed him but then realized that he tore it off for the rebuild. We beefed it up significantly, reconstructed missing architectural elements, and took it back to its original appearance. It was fascinating watching the exterior renovations with the cedar shingles. 
Each one was placed individually to line up with the horizontal shadow lines and to follow the curves of the house. I've also learned to grill contractors when they agree to work on historic properties. Our roof took over six months to complete. The roofers said they knew how to shingle a turret roof. I came home one day and the shingles were nailed in a swirling pattern, not unlike an upside down ice cream cone. I had to take sticky notes and make cuts to show them how to get to lay flat against the curves. They sued me for full payment of the job, but we won having to pay $10,000 on their $20,000 bid due to bad workmanship, length of time to complete, damage from a rainstorm during the process, and general lack of skill. I can't underestimate the work that went into saving this house. It really should have been demolished. No space was untouched, and it was frankly a showcase when it was completed. The house was built in 1892 and then remodeled around 1909. After that, nothing was changed. In that renovation, this fireplace was added to the second floor bedroom at that time, and it decayed over years. I loved that once the infill wall was stripped out, you could see the exterior curve on the inside of the wall. And that curve is right here. So it was squared off and we took that off. And I love that you could see the outside architecture from the inside. I took a job in Cleveland in 2003 and we temporarily moved into a really cool two bedroom apartment. We painted every room, redid the kitchen and made some other upgrades in a rental where we lived for six months. Apparently, I feel compelled to redo every space in which I live. When we first drove by this house, it looked like a grandma house from the outside. But once inside, we were blown away by the oak woodwork, the stained glass windows, and the space. Most of the work on this project was aesthetic, although I did rebuild the front porch and added the columns. I think we were one of the first to paint our kitchen cabinets black. As you can tell, I'm not afraid to play with color. Unfortunately, a few months after buying this house, my relationship ended and I moved out. In 2004, I was making $30,000 a year and had a very limited budget. My realtor found this cool century home in the inner city on the west side of Cleveland, just a few blocks from my job. Over time, I would renovate every room, some more than once, and enjoy bringing it back to life. The exterior was repainted twice. We moved to Medina in 2010 and kept this as a rental for three years. I should have learned my lesson at that time. Being a landlord sucks. After each tenant move out, I had to go back and redo the house. We finally made the decision to just sell it in 2016. The kitchen was redone twice during my time there, going from greasy golden oak to beadboard painted cabinets to a modern wallpapered fun room. The previous owner had a serious love of satin floral wallpaper. I did not. I slowly took the house back to a more period appropriate appearance. The floors were very damaged, so we refinished what we could and painted what we could not. We moved to Medina in 2011 and bought this 3,200 square foot, four square home that had been used as a group home for 30 years. It was very institutionalized and generic on the inside, complete with a full sprinkler system, plastic windows, and chipboard cabinets. We did the first and second floors and made that into a family home that was wonderful for entertaining, we could easily host parties for 100 guests, and had lots of space for fun decorating and collecting. The kitchen was pretty standard, but also pretty gross when we moved into the house. One day, while at work in a meeting, my text messenger kept binging. While I was gone, Josh decided to start demolishing the kitchen and was sending me pictures of cabinets falling off the walls. We finally stripped it back to the bare bones and rebuilt it as a cool, funky space that used a lot of architectural salvage and pieces parts from around the house and from around our local savage shops. I was lucky to track down one of the daughters of the original owner and got a copy of an historic photograph that showed the dining room as it looked in 1912. We did our best to recapture that feeling with a stenciled ceiling, painted walls, and again, a period light fixture purchased at a county flea market that was almost an exact duplicate of the original fixture. Lesson learned, sprinkler systems are gravity fed and form a vacuum when winterized. When you cut a pipe on the third floor, the liquid will drain out below, everywhere. In my job, we did a program called Renew Medina where we restored a home in an historic neighborhood. I was the project director and got to guide the restoration, including the reconstruction of the front porch and choosing a period of appropriate exterior color scheme. 
On this house, we've really had to read the clues and ghost lines left over time to be able to restore it. A stripped down white box that most people didn't notice became something that the community took pride in and was the star of the street with a new paint job and the new reconstructed porch. We also filmed a six episode series called Renew Medina in the style of this old house to document the process. I quit my job in 2016 in Medina and took a position with a human rights organization in Beechwood, Ohio. We bought this mid-century split level home and got to play around with cottage style in which we added a new kitchen and tried to adjust to a new life. The house was great, the job was not. In 2017, I was able to return to my former position in Medina and we moved back shortly thereafter. Luckily, we were able to sell the house pretty quickly. When we returned to Medina in 2017, the housing market was booming and it was hard to find a home. Completely against the wishes of my spouse, I bought a mixed use property that was once home to Ernest Root, the second president of Root Candle. It was my dream home that turned into a maintenance nightmare and almost caused our divorce. My goal was to restore it into a single family home. Ultimately, we ended up restoring the first floor from a dog grooming business to a two bedroom apartment and kept the second floor as a three bedroom apartment. Not one generally to learn from my mistakes, we again tried the landlord route as additional income. It ended badly. Over two years, I renovated the interior three full times again after each tenant moved out and finally sold the house in 2019 to a woman who was realizing my dream of restoring it into a single family home and repairing the exterior. We got a text from a good friend, an old time Medina resident, that a neighbor of theirs was going to sell their home and would we be interested in it? I love a good four square and from the outside, I was excited about the possibilities. Once inside, we realized that the home had not changed much in the 47 years that the couple lived there. The house, however, did have some great features and was essentially a blank canvas on which to play and explore. Our style is historic eccentric, and we've worked hard to capture the essence of the period, but make it comfortable for today's lifestyle. The house was built in 1917 by Eugene Clement, who owned the brick and concrete company around town. In 1950, it was purchased by Amos Mears, an inventor who started the Medina Industrial Park. Mears updated the interior from rustic arts and crafts to a neo-colonial style. We found the original blueprints in the attic, which answered a lot of questions about the changes made. This is my first masonry house. While I knew it was brick when we bought it, it never occurred to me how much that would dictate what we could do inside. It's very hard to hang art on concrete walls. The kitchen did help, but it was impossible to move any walls or reconfigure it. We decided to keep the 1950s cabinet frames and had new inset doors built. The floor tile is period appropriate and much better than the asbestos tiles we removed. The refrigerator was moved to the back utility room to open up the space a little bit. Part of the fun of working on an old house for me is uncovering architectural elements like side windows that are randomly enclosed and plastered over. The floors in this house were black and gouged deeply. Two weeks time, multiple tool rentals and daily trips to Home Depot helped fix that. The 1970s flocked wallpaper was frankly killer awesome, but it just wasn't our style. I finally got to create the arts and crafts dining room wainscoting that had been on my mind for years. To put 25 years and 10 properties in perspective, here are some numbers. Lessons learned. Don't be afraid to try something and to learn a new skill. At the same time, know your limitations. YouTube is a great way to learn new skills, but so is asking your neighbors for advice. Learn who are the trusted tradespeople in your community, hire them, learn from them. Take your time and listen to the house. Observe the evolution, do the research and have fun. Architecture is alive and constantly changing. Like houses, like humans, houses age and need ongoing maintenance and upkeep. For me, is house number nine the final one? Who knows? We'll see where the journey of life leads us next. Tune in next year for the next exciting chapter in our Serial Renovator series, where Matt <laughs> purchases a new house somewhere else and has not yet learned no uh, when to say when?
and hopefully is still married. <laughs> that was amazing. That was cool. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to tap them into type them into the chat bar or tap them into the chat bar. Um, so how how has the sale and uh, buying process changed for better or worse in the last twenty five years? It's been some amazing changes in technology. Yeah, it's DocuSign is a wonderful thing. Um, many of us in, in Main Street and who have office jobs, it's, I think, a little bit easier to go through the process because we have time sometimes or we can take the time out to do what needs to be done. It's overwhelming with all the documents you need to provide for the loans and, and the signatures and do this and send this and fax that. And I don't know how someone that has like a shift job at a factory or the trades, how difficult that is for them. So I love that things are getting more electronic and you can click a button and do most of it on your smartphone. And what um, what percentage of that work have you done yourself? It sounds like you're like at least 50-50. Yeah, it, it depends on the house. Um, like the roof projects, I've re-roofed our garage, but I'm not going up on the fourth story roof of a house to redo that. I have a little bit of a fear of heights. I learned a lot of plumbing from my dad. We both hate it, but I think I get through it better than he. Uh, he taught me the electrical work. We rewired the house in Collingwood completely. I thought it was gonna take maybe a week or two. It took about a year and a half. Um, but I've also gotten to that age and point in my life that while I may be able to do something or I know that I have the skills, sometimes it's just easier to hire someone else to do it and pay them. We just had on, on the brick house we're in currently, there was some step cracking on the exterior brick and I hired a uh, masonry consultant, a local guy who did a wonderful job to go ahead and do the tuck pointing because I knew that I wouldn't have the time and I didn't quite know how to do the color match. So you kind of learn what you like to do, what you want to do, what you need to do and what you can't do. Yeah, yeah, the sage advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, my brain is still addled. It's like, oh, I've, I've done two houses and finished neither of them and oh my God. Yeah. All well, right, it's been, great. It's been a lot of fun. I, I love tearing apart a house and seeing the ghost lines of what was there and doing the research. I've had amazing luck tracking down original photos of some of the houses that we've owned and, and tried to take them back to that. I think sometimes I fall victim to wanting to restore a house to what it looked like and not always taking into account our modern lives. Hmm. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for that quick uh, whirlwind tour of many homes of Matt on the north uh, north side of the state. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Joyce now. Well, we've come to the end. We had four dramatically different stories. They were so much fun to learn from our friends who've been working in uh, preservation, doing the real work when we're on the outside sometimes. Uh, thank you for everyone who participated. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you all at our webinar in September. Goodbye.